Kaczynski. Please join me in welcoming our panel, Heather. Welcome to the panel. Good morning, or nearly good afternoon. Uh, I wanted to let you know that I am an unlikely person to have up here because healthcare had never been something on which I had focused. But when I became aware of what was being snuck through in the stimulus bills last February, I decided it was incumbent upon me for the sake of my children and their children to do whatever I possibly could in whatever small way I could to assist in trying to stop the passage of the health care proposals as we saw them coming down the pike. Um, I deserve no credit for this. I did whatever I could in my small way to help with media or strategy or fundraising, but these were for so many different groups and they all worked so hard. And as well as there are many unsung heroes out there, individuals who did exactly what I did, who pitched in and made this all possible. But it was exciting to do. It was rewarding to have IWF put up the Tracy ad, be involved in the mammography fight, uh, to put out polls to watch the work of AFP and uh, uh, 60 and numerous other groups do what they did. And yet, despite poll numbers that were worse, than Hillary Care had had, this thing was still walking around and breathing. We had Frankenstein on our hands, this dead but still undead thing that they were insisting on passing. Around Christmas, I started hearing scuttlebutt that the Massachusetts race might not be quite as hopeless as the 20-point gap indicated in the polling. And that was reaffirmed by the Rasmussen numbers, which showed that Scott Brown had closed it to nine points. I spoke to a number of political professionals and they told me that it was still way too long a shot to try and spend money on the, the resources for health care needed to be saved for the, the battles that we knew we had and this was just a very long shot. But they weren't my resources, I didn't have any resources, so I figured maybe this was the silver stake. If we could make the race be close and make it be about health care, then we could close that enough that they would get the message. So Independent Women's Voice turned itself into a qualified C4. It raised money. It used message-tested radio ads on health care to try and uh, make that be the issue, because back in early January, it was about the economy and national security. It was speaking primarily to women and independents. Remember, Massachusetts is 51% independent, only 12% Republican. Uh, we found two wonderful Massachusetts physicians who recorded robocalls. Uh, and then when we got right to the time of the election, we had assumed that there would be enough live calls going out to get out the vote. But as best we could tell from asking many people who were involved, not the campaign, but other people, uh, there were no calls going out from independent groups, women's groups, or on the health care message as the 41st vote. So we raised more money and we did that. What a phenomenal day. Brown didn't just come close, he won. I mean, the silver stake was there. And yet, Frankenstein had had his brain removed, his heart cut out, and they didn't get it. Obama and Nancy Pelosi were taking little motorized wheels, propping up this corpse, weekend at Bernie's, here we go, and pretending that he is still alive. And so the independent women's voice has continued its efforts by doing several things. And I encourage you all to go to www.iwvoice.org. We have a list of those members who voted yay and those for the health care bill in November, and another list for those who voted nay for that vote. Remember, Nancy Pelosi probably gave some of them a pass and is twisting their arms now. And these are the ones where we think, of those who voted that way, will be particularly susceptible to hearing from their constituents. They're in tight races, they care, particularly if you know independents who can call them, women who can call them. They sort of dismiss Republicans, you know, we, they're Democrats. But it matters to them to hear from you, to countervail the pressure that is being put upon them now. And if you can help us with radio ads and the phones that we are doing in their districts, that would be tremendously helpful. I want to give you, in my remaining two minutes and 39 seconds, because I'm being really good, because Grace Marie has been very strict, to leave you with three lessons learned from this. The first is that small, independent efforts actually matter. Now, I had assumed that it needed to always be large, but the reality is, is we did polling afterwards, and 68% of the people who heard our radio ad voted for Scott Brown. Uh, we also found that our robocalls, and I'm the world's fastest hanger-upper on a robocall, uh, 
instead of having people hanging up on them, both of our physicians had total strangers tracking them down and calling them to thank them for having recorded those calls. So it does make a difference, and it should reinforce all of you who are volunteering in Tea Party activity groups, whatever it is, it's important to do. Keep doing it. Obviously, the large work is important, too, and some of the other things that were done were fantastically important. But it all is a collaborative effort, and it all matters. Um, the second thing is we need to think long term. The reality is that Obamacare is our fault. And the reason I say that is that after 1994, we did the Republican thing, which is thinking, oh, we've won that. Phew. Now we can go back to doing other things. And the reality is, is that groups like the Galen Institute were left with insufficient funding, no political interest in actually solving the problem so that it wouldn't come back again. It is extremely important that no matter what happens in the Congress, win or lose, defeat this thing or not, we continue with support of Galen, with the Pacific Research Institute, with the National Center for Policy Analysis, with Cato, Heritage, AEI, all of the groups that have wonderful ideas, see their policies through, continue with things like the health care ballot initiatives that are so important to preserving our freedom. And the third and final thing I want to leave you with is this. This is the harbinger of an ethical moment. This is this is a thought beyond health care, but it matters for 2010, and it matters for the type of the country that we are going to have. Independence and women were not really on the table in 2009, but they are now. We are at a time, I believe, where there is manifest disgust with what is now apparent of 70 years of big government. People understand the overreaching, the mismanagement, the false promise of security that leads to dependency, the bankruptcy that we're seeing in Europe and pending in various government programs that we cannot fund and that are delivering care that is not what is promised. There was a story yesterday about how Medicaid is going to be cutting services. They promise, but they cannot deliver, and they tie us down, ready for a 21st century world in which the Leviathan is rolled back where liberty and genuine compassion and a faith in the American people to make their own good, wise choices is restored. And we need your help to accomplish that, because to accomplish that, we can't just have conservatives. We need those independents and those women understanding what we promise. Thank you.